Brian K. Roby is an associate professor of Jewish and Middle Eastern studies at University of Michigan and Arbor. His research focuses on the history of race and racism, black diasporas, Jewish identity in Israel, Palestine, and North Africa from the 19th century to the present. His first book was the, Mizra uh, the Mizrahi era of rebellion, Israel's forgotten civil rights struggle, 1948-1966, which came out in 2015. Um, and in his new current project, um, he is uh, called now Blackness Refracted, Race and the Making of Jewish Color Line in the 20th Century, traces the migration history of racialized Jewish communities and ideas across seas and oceans. Armand Green um, Hayes is Assistant Professor of African American Religious Studies at Harvard Divinity School and currently is working on a book manuscript entitled Underworld Work, Black Atlantic Religion Make Making in Jewish, uh, I'm sorry, Bra Black Atlantic Religion Making in Jim Crow New Orleans, which is under advanced contract with the uh, University of Chicago Press. His book examines the Black Atlantic religious cultures and sexual politics that emerge in New Orleans, a vibrant American port city amidst Jim Crow policing and the, and the migration of African Americans, West Indians, and Central Americans to the region in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Dr. Greenhays uh, has received fellowships and awards, including from the Ford Foundation, the American Academy of Religion, the Mellon Mays Foundation, and this academic year, is a research fellow of the Crossroads Project, Black Religious Histories, Communities and Cultures, funded by the Henry Luce Foundation and housed at Princeton University. So uh, without further ado, um, uh, please well, uh, join me in welcoming Brian and Ahmad. And Brian, the screen is yours. Uh, and feel free to post questions and comments in the Q&A section. So first off, thank you for having me today. Um, I'll be talking about um, basically race relations in Israeli society um, regarding uh, Middle Eastern Jews called Mizrahim um, and Ethiopian Jews uh, called, uh, sorry, European Jews called Ashkenazim. Be highlighting, um, so these are the terms usually used um, in Hebrew. Um, I prefer, um, recently argued that really um, in English, it may be more preferable to uh, refer to them as Afro-Asian Jews, both to link them to a um, more or less to link them to a broader kind of global context um, outside of like a kind of Israeli vacuum um, and to think about how um, their struggle within Israeli society um, is very much interconnected to various different anti-colonial struggles and anti-racist struggles um, um, throughout the world in, um, in the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, I'll be highlighting how Afro-Asian Jews became Black um, prior to the establishment of Israel in 1948 and how blackness has inflected the Mizrahi Israeli ex uh, experience throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, okay, um, this is part of my book, Blackness Refracted. Um, here I just give you kind of a chapter by chapter uh, outline which you can read as I'm talking. Um, at the heart of my research, I deal with this question of, you know, understanding race as a social construct, of course, but what are those building blocks for this construct? Um, what can Israeli society, a relatively new one, teach us about how racial constructs are formed and changed over time and place? Um, I go beyond the question of uh, the centuries old question of are there Jews a race? And instead, del I delve deeper into the implications of the processes involved with creating a black white color line between Jews um, through this exploration of shifting boundaries of racial constructs in Israel, Palestine in the age of modernity. Um, through that, I explore the relationship between Blackness, Jewishness, and the intersections of race and gender expression in the Middle East um, and the French colonial legacies of that. Um, and my work sheds light on the sometimes problematic, sometimes emancipatory or liberatory use of Black thought within Israeli society. Uh, while Jewish and Israel studies scholars have brought, borrowed from critical race theory, um, this often comes with this caveat that there are a few analogies to be made between the Black diaspora and Middle Eastern Jews, um, something with which I firmly disagree. Um, and through this, um, in this book, I'm really looking at the uh, kind of migration of uh, 
history of people's ideas and social constructs. Some of the th key themes at play are the interplay of return or aliyah to and from Israel and Israeli consciousness, diasporic exilic belonging um, to multiple places and multiple times, and how gender and race are performed and received in different spaces and time. Um, I use this metaphor of travel and its various manifestations to investigate the meaning of Blackness globally um, through travel writings, transnational intellectual history, transgressive migration, and most significantly, the migration of Blackness across the Mediterranean. Um, and so for a little bit of background, um, race in Israeli Jewish in the Israeli Jewish context um, is more or less divided nowadays um, and throughout the 20th century um, into three. There are Ashkenazim, who are European origin Jews. Um, they have historically maintained political and socioeconomic power. Mizrahim, who have been racialized as Black, um, a diverse group of Afro-Asian origin Jews, um, most migrated from 19, in the 1950s through the, throughout the 1970s. And then the Beit Israel, um, who I put here as Black and question mark, um, Ethiopian Jews, uh, Ethiopian origin Jews, or East African Jews, um, most migrated um, in the late 70s and 1990s. Um, the question of Blackness and Jewishness um, throughout the late 19th and 20th century really delves into uh, Zionist in, into um, Zionist engagement with race science, um, which we'll get into for a bit. Um, and I want to point out, so when we talk about, um, let's say, for instance, Mizrahim, um, we're talking about North Africa, Asia, um, people who... Uh, you know, uh, may not look necessarily black to an American audience because oftentimes we use kind of um, physical signifiers to understand race, um, but that doesn't work in all contexts. Um, and it's always important to kind of remember this um, quote from Michelle Wright in The Physics of Blackness, um, which notes that blackness cannot be located on the body because of the diversity of bodies that claim blackness as an identity. And to do so, when we do this kind of work of kind of trying to locate blackness on the body, um, it oftentimes reproduces and reifies uh, the idea of biological determinism, um, which is quite problematic. Okay. Um, and here's just a map of when we talk about Mizrahim, uh, these are kind of the main uh, cities and towns in which uh, Mizrahim lived. Um, so today's talk is divided into three parts. Um, first, I'll start off with the vignette of Ida Jiggetts, a Black scholar, Black American scholar in the 1950s who serves as a kind of Janus figure in the book, um, who brings us back to the origins of the racialization of Afro-Asian Jews, um, which I argue began with the early 20th century um, Zionist engagement with scientific racism and colonial racial structures. Um, in the second part, um, I'll briefly return to uh, Ida Jiggetts in the 1950s to show how Black Americans produced knowledge of Mizrahim and were themselves influenced by the Afro-Asian Jewish struggle for civil rights in Israel. Um, in the third part, I'll move on to the 1970s by looking at a forgotten scandal involving the migration of Moroccan Israelis back to Morocco um, and how through the influence of the Black Panthers, both in Israel and the U.S., Jews use Blackness as a framework for empowerment and self-understanding. Um, and if there's time, I'll conclude with some contemporary reflections on um, Afro-Asian Israeli poetry, particularly spoken word poetry. Um, and the centrality of Blackness within the consciousness of Mizrahi activists and intellectuals. Um, so to start off with uh, Ida Jiggetts, who I'll talk about a little bit more later, um, one of the first incidents that um, she recalls in her travel memoir, which she wrote um, while she was completing her PhD, um, called Israel to Me, is her difficulty in understanding how she was racially marked in different ways, depending on whether or not she was in the U.S., um, or in Israel, she was oftentimes mistaken for being a Yemenite Jew, both in Europe and in Israel. And she recalled one particular incident and in when she's walking down the street in Jerusalem and she, hear, she hears children yelling kushi kushi, which is a Hebrew word possessing the strength and ugliness of the N-word for Americans. Um, assuming that they were talking to her, she grabbed one of the little boys um, to scold them. And she asked them, why did you call me that? You know, it's very rude. She said, and the boy responded, who was blonde at the time, um, I wasn't calling you that, I was calling him that, um, as he was pointing to a dark-skinned Yemenite Jewish boy. Um, the blonde-haired child the son of, uh, was the son of American parents. She interviewed him and kind of asked him lots of questions, um, had clearly from a very young age easily translated his understandings of Blackness in the U.S. 
to that of Yemenite Jews um, in Israel. Um, so what I want to get into is how did he learn this word and why did he find it appropriate to call Yemenite Jews uh, this word? And um, in the book, I talk about these three main figures, Arthur Rupin, who's a German uh, social Darwinist, a foundation, also a foundational Jewish demographer, um, Nahum Shalush, who I'll talk about more today, um, ethno-historian, archaeologist, French colonial spy, um, Mitzak Ben Svi, um, also an ethnographer of Jews in Palestine, and the second president of Israel, and Shlomo Goitin, who's a German ethnographer of Jews in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and through these figures, um, I kind of trace that intellectual history that shaped the knowledge about Mizrahi Jewry. Um, and in their work, they kind of mix in travel writings, um, colonial kind of travel narratives, um, as well as some forms of science, cultural studies, and anthropology in their work and sociology as well. So one key, key figure, Nahum Shalus, pictured here, um, born in 1872 um, in Belarusia, um, was known as the kind of Marco Polo of Hebrew literature. Um, his legacy nowadays is more seen as a literary figure, although he wore many different hats. Um, in the early 20th century, he carried out numerous scientific missions on behalf of the French and Ottoman governments, as well as under the auspices of Zionist institutions, uh, particularly the Jewish Territorial Organization. Um, a central theme in his work, though, and scholarship was the search for the primordial origins of the Jewish people and Jewish ties to the lands of the Middle East and Africa. As his active time in North Africa was 1905 and 1916, um, this was a period in time which the Zionist movement um, understood its purpose was to find refuge for European Jewry, but was conflicted on how and where to carry out that goal. Um, and so as part of that kind of like processing, where should it be? Where should this new homeland be? Um, he was trying to find whether or not it should be in uh, Serenica, current day Libya, somewhere in Morocco or East Africa. Um, and he was part of kind of determining where um, was the most viable place um, for uh, Eastern European Jews. Um, what he found most fascinating um, was not the Jewish people of North Africa, um, with whom he often depicted with disgust, but their ability, um, the ability of pre-modern Jewish history to recreate a glorious Jewish past of valor and strength, both in the Roman era, era and Andalusian Spain. Um, as he writes in one case, um, their influence, meaning all Jews in North Africa, um, their influence is to be met with um, throughout the entire atlas in Ethiopia and in the Sudan, where the descendants of the Jews of Serenica founded empires, Judaized the natives, and civilized the country. Neither Greeks nor Romans nor Arabs have succeeded in repeopling it again. It is as if though they were awaiting its valiant Jewish aboriginals. Um, this narrative is very strikingly similar to how Palestine is described in Zionist literature. Um, understanding it as like kind of a land without people, um, having a glorious past, awaiting some kind of uh, uh, new valiant, uh, particularly Jewish community to come and save it. Since um, Through his work as he's traveling throughout North Africa and some of his first encounters with actual people, um, he took note of the strength and virility of the men commenting that they were, were um, quote, well-built, fine specimens of humanity. But the one thing, the one idea that possessed me was how to keep them from getting too close to me. Um, so he really did not like them at all, but he did have a lot of, um, in his narratives, particularly about the men, um, most of it was kind of homoerotically charged, um, understanding them as very strong, but stupid. Um, and part of that was this understanding that maybe they could be great farmers. And so throughout his um, works, he's kind of looking for a African Jewish community um, who could work the land um, so that Eastern European Jews could then come and uh, live off of that. Um, he went on to describe Libyan Jews as, quote, grimy urchins with uh, little brown girls half naked, their black eyes flashed out. Um, of black circles composed of flies that clung to them without causing them any discomfort. This is the scourge of the African Jew, caused by this dis his disregard of even the elements of cleanliness um, and by constant exposure to sand and sun. 
Such writings from him translated into practice the institution of one uh, selective immigration policies during the British Mandate period um, to Palestine, where North African Jews were often turned away from migration due to assumptions that they suffered from sexual diseases, mental health issues, and trachoma, which is a form of eye disease or type of eye disease. Underlying his text, um, both of these quotes come from uh, his book, Travels in North Africa, is an early 20th century scientific racialist understanding of North African Jews. Um, and he seems intent on discovering which communities are most able-bodied to be natural manual laborers. Um, and at its core, it's a work that not only describes the racial differences between Ashkenazi and Mizrahi Jews, but also depicts his search for black and brown Jewish bodies who could work the land. Um, should the settlement of Palestine not work out. Um, his life was fair, fairly interesting. One thing I will point out is um, his kind of colonial ties. Um, so he is actually paid by um, the Moroccan, uh, the French resident general of um, the Moroccan protectorate. Um, but he has a falling out with that. And it's more that um, the resident general was disturbed by his blatant search for black and brown bodies for labor. Um, which put him at odds with the narrative that the French colonial empire wanted for the Jewish community in North Africa, which was that they should become, you should civilize them through um, first labor, but then they should become businessmen and work in colonial administrative roles, rather than only keeping them within a um, agricultural um, vocational setting. Um, much like the kind of Du Bois and Booker T. Washington schism um, among Black Americans, um, the Alliance uh, Israelite Universelle, which argued for this idea of the um, North African Jew being civilized enough to then work um, in business and colonial administrative roles, um, the Alliance thought that the Jews of the region should be civilized through this, um, while Shalush thought it best be trained uh, in vocational training and agricultural work. Um, and he was then kicked out of Morocco um, by the French colonial administration because of this um, discrepancy or the schism between the two. Um, this flavored the discourse surrounding their arrival to Israel with the assumption that they would be a burden on the state because they were not properly trained either in farming um, and they were not intelligent enough to be um, placed into uh, colonial civil or civil administrative roles. Moreover, um, which Lucius tales um, as he went in a uh, detailed throughout his 300 page book um, about wild tales of blood vendetta, vendettas um, carried out by bloodthirsty Moroccan Jewish men with knives and sexy semi-nude Jewish women, um, which we'll talk about here. Um, he paints a picture of North African Jews that persisted in Zionist thought even before their large scale migration um, in the 50s and 60s. Um, here um, are four different postcards. These are French colonial um, postcards from uh, made uh, by Leonard and uh, Rock. Um, and in it, we have on the left-hand side um, pictured an Arab woman as it's depicted, or at least this is the captions, and then a Moorish mo woman, meaning a Muslim, um, followed by Tunisian Jewish women, and then a Jewish woman. You may notice on the left and right-hand side, it is the same person. Um, and what I find fascinating about this is that in the in the left hand side, she's depicted as more kind of uh, sexually permissive, while on the right hand side, she's seen as kind of like um, one provocative and also kind of, um, you know, um, has a bit of an attitude, um, something similar that you see on the one to the left of her. Um, and this flavored the discourse about um, what Jewish women were like in Africa, um, that they were partially Arab. Um, highly sexualized, but also kind of um, still um, um, had this kind of attitude about them, um, a kind of aggression that they had about them. Um, I will note that based on her style of dress, particularly her head covering, she is um, more than likely a Tunisian uh, Jewish woman who may be uh, late teenagers, early 20s, something like that. So how does his idea spread? Um, following his expedition to Morocco, Shlush held conferences throughout America, um, and most importantly, earns the praise of Morris Fishberg, um, as you can see the title of his book here. Um, and um, Fishberg's point, um, he was an American Jewish um, anthropologist um, who published The Jews, A Study of Race and Environment. His main point was to prove once and for all that Jews did not constitute a unified race. 
and so, as such were capable of being integrated in Anglo-Saxon uh, society. Um, in many ways throughout his work and also through the work of um, other German um, and Ashkenazi uh, Zionist intellectuals, um, Afro-Asian Jews acted as a black foil to uphold Ashkenazi Jewish whiteness in that sense. Um, in doing so, he produced a work that outlined racial differences between Jews worldwide in the 20th century for an Anglophone audience that then got um, kind of transported both to Israel, Palestine, as well as to um, Europe. Um, in Fishberg's particular treatment of North African Jews, he took note that many of them were of the, quote, Negroid type, showing the decided Negro infusion, and that based on their nose and head shape, Jews in North Africa and Yemen can be assumed, quote, um, that their origins or its origins is about the same as the origin of Negroid traits among their non-Jewish neighbors in those countries. Um, while that focuses on the physical, it has a lot of implications in terms of how people understood the mental capacity um, as well and their psychological capacity. So um, what happens once the state of Israel is established in 1948, um, Jews, um, uh, Jewish migrants uh, to the country are placed in what's called Mabarot or transit camps. Um, for the most part, um, they were initially meant for um, people to only reside in them for a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months. Um, and some Ashkenazim or many Ashkenazim were also placed in these camps, but they oftentimes were able to leave them after a few weeks. Mizrahi Jews, on the other hand, particularly Jews from North Africa and Yemen, um, were kept in these camps for sometimes years, even decades, for instance, um, with the last one actually being dismantled, or at least the last documented one being dismantled in 1988. Um, life in these uh, transit camps were particularly harsh. These are um, artist reproductions by Gila um, Balas, um, who um, kind of depicted the, um, which I talk about a lot in my first book, um, a lack of employment, lack of education, um, being placed in deserted areas where people did not want to be placed, um, forcible locations. So if someone wanted to leave or escape these, um, the conditions in the transit camps, um, they would be subject to police arrest, um, the taking away of food rationing cards, um, and various other punitive measures to prevent them from leaving. Um, in here, um, I've created a map um, of the precise locations, although this looks fairly imprecise, it is fairly precise, of where the transit camps were in the country. You'll notice um, over here, you'll see that there is um, a lack of many transit camps um, within the Tel Aviv or the main economic center. Um, they're all surrounding them. Um, and throughout the country, you see them kind of spread out um, in the south. Um, to give you a sense of kind of the isolation that people face during this particular time. Returning to Jiggets, um, I want to note that most of her work um, is based on Fishberg and many of the other figures um, that I mentioned previously who were kind of engaging with the scientific racism. Um, and her interest in the country was this understanding that the Black American experience was very similar to that of North African and Yemenite Jews. Um, particularly with regard to integration um, and um, with um, what's called kind of racial uplift in a sense. Um, so on the left-hand side, um, I mentioned a little bit about her racialization and how she talks about it quite a bit in her memoirs. On the left-hand side is a picture of her with her group from NYU, um, mostly Jewish. Um, there are some white Christians in it. Um, and there's an arrow here that shows uh, where she is. Um, because the photographer, despite actually, um, she is, you know, meant to be in the group photo, the photographer cut her out um, and only left her hand, which happens to be sitting on a um, young white Jewish man's lap. Um, so you get a sense. And then while she moves to Israel, um, she is kind of depicted in, at the center stage. Um, she's put on as a, a little bit of a spectacle. Um, in many ways, um, although this one is from the um, um, the Courier magazine, um, Philadelphia Courier. Um, throughout, she's talked about as like the first Negro who comes to the country. Um, there's a lot of curiosity about whether or not um, what the Blacks are like. Um, and she notes um, in one case that she was um, giving a, a lecture to a group of Israeli women, um, Ashkenazi women, 
Um, and they refused to believe that she was actually a Black American because she was so well-spoken, um, and it did not fall into their perceptions of what Africans were like or people of Afro-origin were like. By the 19, uh, 1950s and late 1950s and 1960s, a lot of Afro-Asian Jews became um, you know, very aware. They were already fairly aware of the African-American civil rights struggle um, and began to incorporate a lot of the language that was used um, as a means to understand their own struggle within the country. Um, and here we have a quote um, from um, a um, editor of Israel's Oriental Problem, which was written in English. Um, it was meant for both an British audience as well as a um, English speaking Mizrahi audience and um, to a lesser extent, American politicians. Um, where someone is noting after a particular uprising um, against racism, that the days are over when the Orientals, meaning Mizrahim, would gratefully thank their European masters for any mo little morsel thrown to them in the form of another Uncle Tom in the Knesset. There is growing instead the feeling that we don't want any favors, but rather demand what is ours by right. Whiteism breeds blackism. And through this quote, uh, I find it incredibly fascinating because unpacking it, you see um, echoes of Malcolm X's kind of rhetoric about um, anti-black racism within the US. Um, as well as um, various other um, Black figures, um, Black American figures. Um, in the 1970s, um, by 1971, you have the establishment of the um, Israeli Black Panthers, um, who are directly taking from uh, both the American Black Panthers. So I'll note that the Black Panther movement was not just in the US, um, it was also in the UK, Polynesia, um, India for the Dalit community, um, as well as various other places um, in the world, and Israel was part of that. Um, and it was founded mostly by Moroccan and, and Iraqi Israeli youth um, who were between the ages of 17 and 21. Um, on the left-hand side is one of their protests um, where you see the Black Power Fist um, at the center. Um, and there are two coffins here. One is um, labeled discrimination on the back of the other and is um, labeled racism and they're meant to bury it. Um, and so they're performing this kind of protest. It's a performative protest where they're trying to bury racism and discrimination. And the left hand side is a familiar image of uh, the kind of Black Panther logo um, that was on the cover of a uh, socialist magazine called Maspen. These are some of the images here. In 1976, um, there are um, a number of, uh, there's a large scandal that hasn't been so much written about, although I've recently written about this, um, in which the um, Arab League invites Jews from, um, from the Arab world to return to their natural homeland. Um, they do this as a part of understanding that there is the significant amount of racism against um, Afro-Asian Jews in Israel, Israeli society um, and um, create a fund of about five to $10 million um, to help the repatriation of Jews from Morocco um, and um, uh, Iraq in particular, but also throughout the Arab world. Um, although it seems kind of bizarre in some ways, some Jews actually did take them up on this offer. On the left-hand side is Yusuf and Dorit Nawi, um, uh, two kind of infamous cases in which uh, they fled Israel um, and went to Austria and then Baghdad. Um, in 1975. And <clears throat> the problem with this, though, is, of course, by this time, Saddam Hussein is in power. Um, Yosef, in particular, is um, employed as a propaganda minister uh, of sorts, um, where he's put on Baghdad radio, national radio, um, deriding the um, Israeli state for its racism. And at this period period of time, um, many of the Jews who are living, um, you know, or from uh, the Arab world are still listening to the radio stations of their country of origin. Um, and so he's directly actually talking to some family members or distant family members that he knows um, and tells them to, you know, come back, return to your homeland. Um, enough of things like this is Zionist hell, as he puts it, um, and things like that. 
In addition, um, we have, um, besides these two, we have um, at least 100 to 200 people, um, Moroccan Jews, who do return to Morocco. Um, I don't know exactly what happened to them once they returned to Morocco. They likely went back to, or they went to France afterwards if they didn't stay. Um, but the Israeli state and Israeli newspapers are really curious, why would you want to leave this wonderful place, and especially for an enemy state at the time Iraq, um, well, is still an enemy state to Israel. Um, and one person who's interviewed during this time um, frames it within a kind of Black context, um, particularly with the Black Panthers and various other kind of understandings of Blackness where he says, we've had enough of this country, 28 years we put up with you, Ashkenazim, and we didn't become affluent from the Wadi Salib and Black Panthers riots. Um, Wadi Salib happens in 1959, and then the Black Panthers are 1971 to 1973, um, that the Blacks did against the whites. So we see that already there is a very strong connotation of understanding Mizrahim is Black and Ashkenazim is white, um, and that there is it's a racialized struggle. So now we're saying, thanks, that's enough. We're going back to Morocco. And the statement not only points to the usage of migration as a tool of protest, similar to that of the great, great migration of Black Americans to the North, um, but also to the legacy of racialization um, of Mizrahim um, throughout the 20th century. And what these cases teach us, in um, particular, uh, the one, the Moroccan migration, is that the question of Blackness, what it looks like, who possesses it, and how it functions can and has shifted in Israeli society, which I'll talk about in a second, when we explicitly engage with Black thought, we find a more nuanced understanding of the situation of Mizrahim um, and how they responded to their own oppression. And here is a map to give you a sense, um, although it's not side by side with the Mambarot map, I will tell you that um, what you're seeing is that if it's red, it's where um, since in 2011, where a vast majority or high population density of Afro origin Jews live. Um, and you'll notice, and if it's blue, there's like a, there's a majority, but it's not as high. Um, you'll notice that in the Tel Aviv area, there is um, no color there, um, quite literally, um, um, because they still live in m many of the same places that they were um, forcibly located to um, in the 1950s and 60s. Okay, moving on to um, um, the kind of current day understandings of Blackness, um, the migration of Ethiopian Jews in the 1970s to the 1990s, um, and still to this day, um, kind of complicated this notion of what Blackness means uh, within Israeli Jewish society, um, in which, um, although Ethiopian Jews themselves, while in Ethiopia, did not understand um, themselves as Black, um, because within Ethiopian society, you have a range of different colors between red, brown, um, green and black, where most Jews were within the red category, um, being of Amhara origin or Tigrania, um, they, both by American Jewish audiences and by Israeli Jewish audiences, were immediately understood to be black. Um, as you see on the right-hand side, this is Ori Teshuma, who is um, both an activist, spoken word poet, and a musician. Um, they were understood to be black um, because of their skin color. Um, and so it was a difficult kind of transition um, of understanding now that they're no longer red in the case um, of Ethiopian society, but now they're black. Um, and the first generation very much rejected this notion, while as the second generation has become, begun engaging with questions of global blackness and where they fit into these categories with things like the Ethiopian uh, Lives Matter, a movement um, that um, mirrors or parallels the Black Lives Matter movement in the US. Um, and in the Israeli case, they talk a lot about police brutality, um, uh, several police shootings that occurred over the past several years, um, and various other forms of institutionalized racism that occur. On the left-hand side, we have Yossi Sabari, who is a Yemenite um, activist, poet, spoken word poet, um, and artist. Um, and I want to conclude with one of his um, quotes here, or one of his um, excerpt from his poems. So in this poem, it's fairly long. I wanted to give like this very short one. Um, it's called, I Always Wanted to be Ashkenazi, which I translated as always wanted to be white, and you'll see why. 
um, where he juxtaposes what whiteness means here. And it's one of the first times that you, or one of the few times that you actually get um, a initially a definition of what whiteness is rather than just focusing on or trying to define or confine what blackness is. Um, and so he says, I always wanted to be Ashkenazi. It's the culture of Vienna, not the wretchedness of the East. Alas, my bad luck, destiny wanted that I would be born a curly haired Mizrahi. A wretched toddler who's intended to suffer from dark brown skin and then as a stalk with a small brain, but a penis that is huge. A foolish imbecile possessing potential to become at best a port worker. And throughout here, I'll say that um, him and various other um, poets, including Ori Tushuma um, and Adi Kassar, are influenced very directly and explicit and explicitly talk about their um, influences um, from Black intellectuals like Franz Fanon, Patricia Hill Baker, and W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, and they use Blackness in a global context um, to interrogate notions of diasporic belonging. What does it mean to be a Yemenite Israeli Jew who is racialized as Black? Where are their ties? Is it to a kind of global Black diaspora? Is it to Yemen? Is it to Israel? Um, and oftentimes they kind of combine all of these things. Um, and um, throughout, they talk a lot about double consciousness and what Blackness means for Israeli Jews. Um, writing as Black men, women, and queer folks, um, these poets interrogate race and racism in ways that resonate well with transnational conversations of race and Blackness. Um, and to conclude, from this examination of how um, Mizrahim themselves um, frame their struggle for equality and social justice alongside African-American perspectives on the Mizrahi struggle, we can see that the Community in Israel has been in con constant conversation with Black thought. Um, and so my research is putting Jewish studies in the, to this much needed conversation with Africana and Middle Eastern studies um, on this topic. And my work um, builds upon scholars in Afro-American studies and that it helps scholars move beyond assumptions that the history of slavery or skin color is the one intrinsic factor determining Blackness. All the more so I complicate assumptions of an inherent whiteness of Jews and Israelis um, which allows us to revisit um, with the more critical and informed eye notions of a fixed categorical Black-White division or Arab-Jewish division, um, these binary modes of thinking, and moves us to a more nuanced understanding of racial constructs as spatial, temporally fluid. Um, and so what I hope I've done today in, in the brief um, in this presentation is show how um, Jewish, Black, and Israeli history have a shared connection by providing a completely different story um, of uh, Israeli society that is centered not on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or Black-Jewish relations in America, but how one marginalized group, Afro-Asian Jews, can learn from the other African-Americans, and of course, vice versa. Thank you. And now we'll welcome Ahmad. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Brian, for um, an exceptional talk, uh, just to hear you expound further on uh, your book and uh, other written works on the subject. Um, and also huge thanks to, to Magda and the folks at Fordham for, for putting together uh, this conversation. I have some comments and questions, and so I'll just jump in so that we can use uh, the time we have left wisely. Uh, Okay, so Roby's uh, Blackness in Motion, the centrality of Black thought for Afro-Asian Jewry in Israel is an incisive theoretical undertaking. Uh, he offers an expansive demonstration of the, quote, impact and influence of early Zionist anthropology and ethnography on the study of non-European Jews. He also points us to the problem, right, of how Jews as a category is conceptualized in Jewish studies. And I'd add also in religious studies and in black studies. And so perhaps problematizing the category itself. Uh, and then thirdly, Roby, as Roby puts it, we might look to how one black community looked to another as a means of understanding the global color line. In this way, I see Roby as reorienting our attention to untilled geography and overlooked racial subjects endeavoring to unearth new meaning about the development and evolution of racial blackness and modernity across the Atlantic from the Americas to Israel. In his study, uh, he demonstrates how whiteness and proximity to whiteness orchestrates a racializing process 
whereby anti-Blackness functions as social, intellectual, and religious capital. In this way, and while not immediately engaged in Roby's written account on this subject, I would argue that uh, the, the, the archival and, and contemporary subjects also elucidate, perhaps as Afro-pessimists have long argued, that anti-Blackness is an antagonism that shapes, governs, and structures the world as we know it. As Frank Wilderson, Salamewit Tarif, and Patrice Douglas have argued, anti-Blackness is, quote, a regime of violence that positions Black people and perhaps also all Blackened people as internal enemies of civil society. They warn us that this regime of violence, anti-Blackness or anti-Black racism, cannot be analogized uh, with the regimes of violence that disciplines the Marxist subaltern, the post-colonial subaltern, the colored but non-Black Western immigrant, the non-Black queer, or the non-Black woman, end quote. Anti-Blackness is connected to slavery and the plantation, yes, but it is also a product of what uh, perhaps Orlando Patterson and others have theorized as crystallizing through NATO alienation, gratuitous violence, and general dishonor, which we might read here as being likened to confinement in the transit camps, right, as a, a kind of form of uh, ghettoization, uh, predatory integrationism, and religious and racial persecution upheld through perpetual statelessness and denial of civic engagement, such as the right to vote. There are, of course, obvious semblances, yet stark a contrast between the slave status that perhaps Afro-pessimists posit and the refugee status. And I dare not engage, as they warn us, in the ruses of analogy so central to liberal fantasies about subjectivity and progress. Here I mean to suggest that there is a lot worth discussing with regard to Blackness and what it means to be Black in despite connection to a history of enslavement. For instance, critical theorists, Christina Sharp, Sadia Hartman have argued uh, that the belly of the ship births blackness, end quote. Here it seems that Roby is complicating this assertion, pointing us to a blackness and a blackened experience that does not lie in the transatlantic slave trade as we know it, but a different kind of force movement. Uh, I invite Roby to comment on this particular point in order to draw connections between Jewish studies and prominent debates in critical Black studies on racial Blackness and the potential problems of analogizing, both for the subjects of this study and for the scholar. How is racial Blackness configured through different slaveholding and confining practices? What do we make of these distinctions and, and why do they matter for this project? Moreover, Ruby has argued while citing Barbara and Karen Fields' racecraft that, quote, race itself is a product of racism that is hailed, interpolated, and even conjured up in a process not too dissimilar from witchcraft. And I wondered about the function and utility of this assertion, given what we know about a normative white Jewishness that so often worked in opposition to African derived spiritual traditions and complex categories such as that of the witch, right, and, and of witchcraft. And so pointing to an African past here. And so in some ways, it would be helpful to hear more about how Africanness, not necessarily Blackness, even as they are related, perhaps co-constitutive, how that's functioning within 20th century Israel and how Jews engage with Africa, especially since Israel quite literally sits on the Western edge of the Arabian plate, but the African plate at its bounds, right? And so I'm particularly struck by the question of Africanness in relation to, but distinct from Blackness, precisely because the actors especially early Zionist anthropologists, as you know, affirmed a hierarchical view of Afro-Asian Jewry as backward, freezing Jews in the European Middle Ages while depicting European Jewry as teleologically advanced, end quote. Modernity and this idea of the modern religious subject, it seems, works as approximation to whiteness and as anti-Africanness, perhaps Afrophobia, which evolves into anti-Blackness. Might you be able to walk us through these categorical distinctions and how they emerge and are reconfigured through Israel's cultural and political history? 
And finally, I'd like to turn briefly to a comment on uh, Jigets, I believe I'm saying that correctly, hopefully, and other uh, African American engagements with Israel. I'm struck by her own strategies at claiming Americanness over a Negro identity and her appeal to notions of Black excellence as a strategic maneuver to, as you know, counter, quote, the image of the, the Negro Akushi as one of savagery and backwardness, end quote. You also show us that she was perceived as Moroccan, Yemeni, Ethiopian, and so on. Some might describe her as being able to pass in some sense, especially given her own North Carolinian uh, roots. You then situate her navigation of this quandary as her being able to make a global Black connection between African Americans and Ms. Rahim and Israel. Israel, in which this, quote, constant mistaken identity re reinforced her affinity and sense of solidarity with Yemenite Jews in Israel. I'm curious to know if there is evidence, right, of affinity and a sense of shared solidarity for her beyond this autobiographical signposting. I'm just wanting to know more about her investments in struggle, political struggle, if, if such a thing existed. Um, and so, uh, you know, are there examples, right, of a politically motivated attempt to join this global struggle against anti-Blackness? I think that that's perhaps the, the, the main point in question here. And I think connected to this point, uh, what are the political commitments undergirding, you know, this Black internationalism that's so prominently a part of your project. And so it seems to me at least, you know, I'm, I'm trained as a historian of African American religion. Um, and so it seems that for many of the black social reformers, uh, academics, political elites, and movement preachers like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who are engaged in this conversation, that they're largely relying on a US like black social uplift reform, right? Which uh, was routinized through the criminalization and degradation of the working class in the service of a new Negro talented 10th that is in concert with and perhaps included by a white elite, white elite political class. And so I just appreciate any thoughts you might offer on this point. And, and so finally, might this appeal at a global Black solidarity among Black and peoples also function as a sort of utopia or as an escape from social conditions at the helm of race relations in the US. Um, and so there's a lot more I would like to say, but for the sake of time, I will end there. Uh, I, th I think we can just talk about this. Um, you've already given us so much to think about. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Um... I will say um, in terms of, you know, one thing uh, I'll comment on the last part and then go into the Africanness um, or sense of solidarity with Africa. Um, with Jigit's one able to pass and whether or not she kind of like has um, later engagement with um, political Mizrahiyut or, you know, Afro-Asian civil rights struggle, um, she doesn't. And that has to do with her own personal life um, and difficulties she's faced, um, which you may have read about a little bit. Um, and she does get out of academia, um, but her life does show some of the problems with Black internationalism that it's not always liberatory, right? Um, we can't imagine that, you know, just because you're Black or that you're engaged with Black thought means that, you know, you're progressive radical or, you know, you're moving forward in some ways or it's reformation. Sometimes it's an affirmation or reification of problematic, um, you know, understandings of what Blackness is. Um, and she's an example of this, right? Um, in her later life, she then goes into, um, she works with Nixon and Reagan um, in various different drug rehabilitation programs. Um, and this has a lot to do with her understanding of racial uplift, right? Um, even, you know, her and um, various other people engaged with um, trying to understand what is um, the Mizrahi struggle in Israel, Black Americans who are doing that. Um, they are framing it within the same understanding of like kind of the urban league in, in a way of like, you know, these are in the same way that the Southern Black American migrants are coming up north, um, who are very backwards and uneducated, maybe illiterate. Um, that is what the Mizrahim are. Um, and so we see some parallels between both this understanding of a new Negro um, and a new Jew in that sense, which is what, you know, part of what the kind of or a big chunk of what the Zionist movement was trying to create was a new Jew. Um, the other aspect, um, I'll tell this kind of funny, not so funny joke um, about um, connections to 
Africa. So for North African Jews, um, the kind of civilizing mission, the um, one racialization of them as black, but then to uplift them into whiteness um, was probably pretty successful, I would say, um, both in France and Israel, um, in that um, their understanding of themselves, you know, there's this, um, in the early 60s, um, there's a big joke about like, you know, if you ask like, let's say, a Moroccan Jew where you're from, they'll say Betis um, in like a kind of thick Arabic accent, um, as if they're coming from Paris, even though they've never stepped foot in there. Um, and you see another example of that with a politician, Eli Shai, um, who's Tunisian, and with regard to Tunisian origin, with regard to African asylum seekers, non-Jewish ones, um, a few years ago, he had this speech where he said that they need to remember that this is a white man's land um, and that there's no place for this kind of African culture. <laughs> um, and this is coming from an African man, right? Um, saying this, um, and fairly kind of olive skin person, right? Um, so to get into that, you know, that complicates again that notion of like, you know, is there always this connection based on, you know, racialization? Um, and how people kind of use um, various different kind of shifting notions of race throughout history. Um, you mentioned something else that was connected to that, but I kind of forgot what it was. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think you kind of answered it. And, and I think in some way you're uh, thinking about how, you know, Afrophobia, this anti-Africanist, it puts, it brings to mind Fanon, right? You know, thinking about a certain kind of anti-blackness that always doesn't need you know uh white bodied persons to carry it right it, it can function um you know in in a variety of ways depending on the context and so here it is this really complex situation where uh and i think this is a the case globally i think anti-blackness becomes a catalyst for you know class ascension or uh, a certain kind of um, acquiescence into civ civil society. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that, that that is precisely what's going on. And, and, and as, as I read your work, you know, a certain kind of global Black political solidarity emerges precisely because people are responding, right, to this global phenomenon, right? There's a way in which you can't untether the two. Um, I guess, yeah, and that, yeah. that reminds me, like, I really liked your framing of, like, you know, Blackness as confinement in a sense, and that that's the kind of shared history in that way. Um, you know, there are a lot of, you know, Black scholars who are trying to get away from that kind of middle, middle passage of epistemology, um, and this is trying to help that you know, or contribute to it in some ways. Um, and I'll say, like, with the transit camps, um, there is, like, a direct parallel, and I'm still trying to find um, more evidence of this. Um, that it was an intentional policy learned from the American government um, in which they're placed in these transit camps um, and then housing projects are built um, mm -hmm. directly after um, that are, you know, public housing uh, and they are then moved from the transit camp to public housing that then become slums and ghettos um, and called yeah. as such, right? Um, it's very, very similar in, uh, in the U.S. and numerous other places where people who are racialized as Black um, are confined in these spaces. Um, yeah, yeah it, it almost reminds me, I mean, contemporaneously, right, we can point to, you know, the kinds of allegiances between, uh, you know, Israeli police and say, you know, the NYPD. I mean, they're in terms of um, surveillance tactics. Uh, and so you're just thinking about how activists are kind of reigniting a certain kind of global Black political solidarity around these questions even today. Um, and so I don't know if you have thoughts on the contemporary moment. Um, so there's that piece for me. And then I'm also curious, you know, kind of to backtrack how you came to th this project and this work, um, just to hear, you know, perhaps a, a contemporary assessment of where we are, and then maybe just some thoughts on like how you come to this work. Yeah, so in terms of like contemporary assessment, there is like uh, one thing that complicates it even further is the um, African asylum community um, within Israel, many of whom um, are coming from East Africa and Sudan. Um, and so there's been this creation of a, for them, um, of a category of just like Sudanese, um, as they're called, even though they don't all come from Sudan. 
Um, and that is different from Ethiopians. Um, and so there's a co connotation that Ethiopians are the Jewish ones, Sudanese are the non-Jewish ones. Um, and on top of that, you have, um, so once um, this mass migration of Ethiopian Jews, which happens um, as a result of the civil war that was occurring um, through the 70s and the 90s, um, you have them place in the same exact towns and locations and neighborhoods as you know um, North African Jews are placed in, right? Um, and then experiencing the same kind of issues um, again, even though it's now not the 1950s, it's the 1990s, they're going through the same exact issues of confinement, um, ghettoization, um, also um, this focus on more vocational training rather than like, you know, um, being engaged in higher education. And I will say, you know, still to this day, you know, most of the um, university population of students are Ashkenazi, mm -hmm. um, right? Um, even though, you know, for up until the 1970s, the majority of the Jewish population were of Afro-Asian origin. Um, and there was like a distinct, so one thing that the Israeli Black Panthers argued um, about or kind of pointed out was that there seemed to be a policy put in place to bring in Soviet Jews in order to whiten the country, um, which was quite successful um, because it did kind of balance out the, you know, who comes from Africa and Asia and who comes from Europe. Um, and they, the Soviet Jewish population comes at the same exact time as Ethiopian Jews, right? Um, and their migrations are treated very, very differently, um, where there's a lot of questions of whether or not Ethiopian Jews wholesale are even Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas with Soviet Jews, many of whom um, either don't, did not, some of whom did not have affinities with Jewishness um, or were not Jewish according to the state law, um, were still able to migrate to the country um, as Jews and Israelis. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, I came to this, um, you know, um, my uh, PhD advisor, Moshe Behar, um, was an activist and a scholar of uh, this kind of thing. Uh, and uh, as I was working uh, in grad school, I came across a lot of police archival um, records um, where I saw that there was like a clear, um, within their own police reports, there was a clear racialization of Mizrahi Jews um, throughout, um, seeing, seeing them as Black. Um, and then reading the writings, these early writings of um, Mizrahi activists, they have like all of these, like, you know, that one quote is like one example of it, you know, the usage of the word Uncle Tom's, um, you know, very clear um, rhetoric that originates from Malcolm X's speeches. I don't know how they heard these things, um, but, you know, they clearly did or read them um, and uh, various things like that. And I was like, well, there's something there, you know, there's like, you know, um, in addition to this notion that, you um, there's this common phrase that, oh, the next generation, these um, ethnic problems will disappear um, because then there will be more intermarriage. And even thinking about the term intermarriage assumes that there's like a very, two very different people, even though, you know, they're Jews, right? Um, so what is the intermarriage going about? And that never really took place, that idea of like, you know, although people will argue that it's a post-racial society, um, and things are much, much better than the 1950s and 60s. All of this kind of rhetoric sounds familiar, I'm sure to you. <laughs> but like, yeah, everything's way better. So why are you complaining about, you know, other forms of discrimination that take place? Right. Yeah, no, that's so fascinating. And thank you for, you know, providing some of that. That background is really helpful. Um, and even to think about um, police records turning um, state mediated documents as a source, right? In religious studies, Jewish studies, Black studies. And so um, I'm really appreciative of, of hearing um, that context. I know we have to turn to, to Q&A. So I'll hold, uh, yes. hold back on my last question. And no, 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 go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll wait. Uh, so you have, uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I guess, I mean, the last question is really about um, how you're theorizing race, right? And so to think, about um, racial blackness, right, as um, a phenomenon. Uh, I don't know if you you would describe it as a phenomenon, or or is it um, is it something far more abstract or elusive um, that functions primarily through a certain kind of normative white order, a white Jewishness um, that is always kind of seeking to stabilize itself. I don't know if that's um, what, what you're getting at. And I, I was just curious 
because you were drawing from the, you know, Barbara Fields and Karen Fields and so with racecraft. And I just was curious to know how race is functioning. Like, is it, you know, are you joining this debate about whether or not it's a, still a social construction or is it something else? Is it a philosophical category? Uh, we know it's not biologically <laughs> uh, determined, even though, of course, <laughs> that persists. Yes. I just, just a final comment, perhaps on 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 race, um, what race is doing here. Yeah, that's a great one and a hard one because I've been thinking a lot more about it. I'm kind of in the midst of it. Um, I'm, I don't see it as an abstract category. Um, I do see it as a kind of philosophical question that has like on the ground, like you know, actual um, implications and consequences in a sense. Um, and what I'll say to you know, race, whiteness as a race um, is always meant to be unstable um, and amorphous in that sense. And blackness, um, particularly for anti-black racism, um, blackness always has to be stable in a sense. You have to root it in like a place and a certain type of person and a body that does certain things. Um, and it can't be this more, you know, amorphous, like kind of like fluidity, right? There's always the staticness within blackness, with at least within anti-Black racism. Um, and so I'm kind of like in the middle in that sense, trying to like, you know, get away from that while still describing it as such. So people understand that, yeah, you know, Blackness has to be static in order to, you know, vilify it in a way, right? Um, while also being kind of, um, you know, cognizant that within Jewish studies, race has and racism has like a longer you know, not a longer history but like a more complex history um particularly for ashkenazi jews who some of which were you know racialized as black particularly polish jews um in the you know pre-19th century um then of course um this very difficult conversation that's starting to be had about well there's lots of scientific racists um who are you know jewish and um one in particular arthur rupin um, is working sometimes alongside um, German, you know, scientific racists um, during the Nazi regime. Um, and so what does that what does that mean in terms of how uh, Jews understand um, racial categories for themselves um, and the idea of a Jewish kind of unified race um, versus the actual lived experience of understanding that, no, well, how it functions is that Jews classify themselves in various different racial categories. And there's, there is a hierarchy in place. Um, that's part of a transnational conversation. That's not just limited to, you know, Israel in this period of time or the U S in this period of time. Um, it is something that is, you know, going around um, in this transnational discourse and rhetoric about what race is for a Jewish community. And this is actually a perfect segue to uh, a couple of questions that I have some for both of you, some for, for Brian alone. Um, and this is about, I think, thank you both for complicating. Alma, don't go. There is, I think, <laughs> something for you here too. <laughs> uh, it, for, for complicating both the issues of blackness and the issues of Jewishness and, and how they, com you know, they overlap, they move around, they, they crisscross and and depends on on the position where we are. So I, I want to ask a question about where certain types of Jews fit in these different from these different vantage points. So one is as you were both conversing, I was thinking about where do um, Afro-Asian Jews in Israel fit in the uh, sort of from the perspective of the of global blackness of global um you know black internationalism in that kind of way if we were to shift into they're after all jews and jews are this complex category of being always sort of on the outside and you know not fitting in whether within you know european society european jews and and other categories i wonder whether both of you can reflect on that and the other one is uh, building on a question that um our colleague um um Dr. Bukali uh, from Algeria has uh, has asked, how do you classify the situation of Saharan Jews from Algeria and their immigration after the independence of uh, Algeria? Uh, they had not been French citizens, and at, at the same time, they didn't speak Arabic, right? They had been French citizens, but they didn't speak Arabic. 
And I would like to follow up as I, you know, Baron, you had that those categories, Ms. Rahim, and the, um, where do Sephardic Jews, but not those who lived in North Africa or in the Arab lands, fit in your categorization? Because they obviously had a very uh, elitist uh, view of themselves, uh, higher than the Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, so where do they fit in these um, in these different spaces? And certainly, you know, there are many of them are now in Israel, coming from France and other other places. So I, I wonder whether you could both reflect on these different ideas of fitting fitting in those categories. Yeah, I will say um, in terms of that last uh, question. Um, so Sephardic Jews, um, you know, coming from the Iberian Peninsula, um, are you know, they actually fit into the Mizrahi category um, in many different ways. So the the quote that I had there, um, Israel's Oriental Problem, is actually um, the editor of it, um, is a Sephardic Jew um, from Palestine um, who had been there for a while. He's part of the elite. He was a judge in the British Mandate period. Um, but then he sees that um, despite the kind of communal understanding of them being a historical elite, that they're still racialized as Black. Um, in many different ways, and sometimes the same ways as Jews from North Africa um, and uh, Asia as well. Um, and so, you know, these are, you know, the Mizrahi category in a sense is really just a hodgepodge of non-European Jews. Um, Ethiopian Jews have been kind of set apart from that um, for, um, for historical reasons that have to do with um, these categories of scientific racism. So, um, in the early 20th century period, um, Nahum Shalus is working on North Africa, Jacques Fadovich is working on Ethiopia, um, and then Arthur Rupin writes this uh, book where he um, sets out these categories, where he says that um, some Jews are racially pure Jews, others are foreign types um, and outside Jews, and so uh, Jews from Ethiopia, um, as well as Jews from India, are seen as this kind of foreign outside type. Of Jew, right? Um, and he argues that North African Jews are kind of a mix of that, um, where they probably are, you know, authentically, I'm saying probably are authentically Jewish, um, but they have this Negroid infusion. Um, and so using that terminology, Negroid infusion, really, um, it is a tool in which to make sure that um, Europeans in, ge in general, both European Jews and non-Jews, understand Jewishness as inherently white and that they there is a binary division in which Jewishness cannot mean blackness right um by repeatedly saying that those who are you know mixed of sense have this Negro inf infusion um for the Saharan Jewish population I don't work so much on them I will say that um at least for the Amazigh um, who migrated to Israel, um, they are, you know, um, you know, they have this place within uh, Moroccan society, at least. Um, and that becomes kind of the, the derogatory term that is used against all Moroccan Jews. Um, the stereotypes that Nahum Shalus talks about in it, uh, in his work, um, as them as cave dwellers, um, this medieval stasis of like, you know, kind of like backwards living and stuff like that. Um, he's talking about specific tribes or specific communities of Jews from the Amazigh population, but then that notion gets placed on all Jews from, let's say, Morocco or Libya, um, where there is a kind of derogatory term, shaluch, which is a tribe um, in the um, Moroccan area, era, uh, area um, and that's just of how Moroccans are sometimes called, in a sense, um, even though they may come from the Iberian Peninsula or the Arab world or be natives from another tribal community, um, things like that. What about the global uh, blackness and the... Oh, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> and again, yeah. both of you may chime in. <laughs> yeah, um, do you want to say something about um, black internationalism or... I mean, I your comment actually reminds me of, uh, you know, recent work in Black studies by critical theorists, you know, I'm thinking about Zakia Iman Jackson's Becoming Human, right? And so her um, her use of the term Black end as, as thinking about um, a certain kind of ongoing, what she calls an ontological plasticity of Black end, a Black end experience, one that um, 
can be everywhere having a fleshly experience, but also at the same time, nothing at all, right? It literally is, uh, it is, it is about a certain kind of subjection, right? That's always attended to violence and um, repudiation. Uh, and so I, I think theoretically, um, I think what the archive that you're working with actually perhaps deepens that assessment, right? Of a certain kind of ontological plasticity. Um, and, and I think black, a blackened experience um, leads me to also think about uh, how people can become blackened depending on right certain kinds of social contexts um, in the same way that people can become white, right? And we know, at least in this story that you're telling, that that is also the case. And so these categories are they're they're able to shift and transform, um, and it's all about suffering, proximity to suffering, to death, to confinement. Um, that that is it's about a certain kind of negation of agency and civic engagement and rights and all of and so i think to be black in is to be as close to a slave experience um as possible and of course that looks differently in different geographical temporal you know political context i don't know if that fully gets at your question but i think the theorist in me is is, is still thinking through um what you've offered us and i don't have a conclusion i think it actually opens up more questions uh to really think about these categories that we hold dear and perhaps take for granted and don't problematize enough yeah i'll also add you know in terms of like one black internationalism and global blackness um is that you know outside of the u.s case oftentimes when people engage with questions of blackness in society um, there's this pushback of like, oh no, that's not us. There's no such, there are no blacks here. Um, you get that in Brazil, um, people still say this, there are no blacks here um, uh, for bizarre reasons. Um, you get that in a number of different uh, societal and um, uh, geographical contexts. Um, and, you know, the pushback for that is that, well, you're importing, you're importing an American construct um, onto such and such country. Um, because of American imperial hegemony and things like that, um, which one, I don't, I don't think that it's an importation in a sense, but two, it does get into this notion of this um, American hegemonic kind of uh, framework that exists, um, which Black internationalism does participate in, um, in some ways. I mean, so I saw there was another question about uh, the Black Hebrews in Israel um, from 1969. Um, and I'll say that um, when they migrated, so this is a, a cult um, uh, from um, mostly based in um, originally in south side of Chicago, um, migrates to Liberia and then to Israel. Um, and what's fascinating about their case, and so they burn their passports and, you know, um, to become stateless, um, and it becomes a huge scandal that goes on until the 1980s. Um, Israel's response um, was to actually um, um, engage with Black civil rights leaders, particularly Barrett Rustin um, and the Philip, Ro um, um, Philip Randolph Institution, um, in order to kind of act as mediators between uh, the uh, Israeli government and the Black Hebrews. Um, and this is something that has a long history in the state of Israel, whereas the state saw from uh, the late 50s onwards, Black Americans as like the biggest political block um, and soft power um, that could be kind of like, you know, you know, that you would engage with if you don't want to engage with the U.S. government in itself. Whether or not that assessment um, is valid or not is another question, but um, they did see it as such. Um, and so Bayer Rustin goes and actually creates a survey. He surveys the Black uh, Hebrew community in Israel, um, talks to uh, various different mayors and things like that, mostly of Mizrahi origin, because they were actually placed in uh, where um, Afro-origin Jews were. Um, and throughout, he's trying to make this assessment of whether or not um, the actions that the Israeli government is taking is racist or not. Um, and 
it's interesting that they ask particularly black Americans um, about this question rather than kind of a larger question about what racism is, um, because there is this kind of notion that, well, the black American experience is the experience um, of racism um, in the world, which you know has some truth to it, but there's also many other forms of that, right? Um, and one issue in particular that they were um, concerned about, um, uh, Rustin in particular, was that um, once the Black Hebrews came in 1969 and 1970, um, the Israeli airport actually banned Blacks from entering the country. Um, people were subject to immediate deportation and returned to um, whatever country they came from, but particularly Blacks from the U.S., um, and of course, this was, you know, noted in a number of different Black American newspapers um, as racism, which it was. Um, and Bear was um, successfully kind of advocated for the end of that policy, which was slightly informal, but actually was an official policy put in place um, by the IDF and Border Patrol agents. Um, There's so, so much to continue discussing. It was a fantastic uh, talk and a great response from you, Ahmad. So I'm really grateful to to both of you. And I hope we'll reconvene again and maybe when your book comes out and engage uh, again in these uh, really important conversations. So thank you so, so much for, for doing this with us. And thank you all for joining us and to be continued. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you.